again, for the sake of being able to discuss certain matters, consider man into the body and the mind, or sometimes I might call it the life of the hormones and the life of the neurons, and consider, even though man does seem to occupy a special place, that at this level, from the level of consciousness, what, what that amounts to, the intellect ignited, and man, the creature, he can speak. And down here, we would have much in common with the other beasts on this planet who do not think. Now consider from the level of consciousness down, speaking now, we can point out concerning the other animals and we can point out concerning man, whichever you find to be the easiest. But the only reason I bring up the other animals is not to try and compare man and say that man is like so and so, but we do have in common certain things with other creatures on this planet, the same as we do with clouds, planets, trees. But at the physical level, talking about creatures who are simply physical, no intellect, speaking about man's likewise level of existence that is simply physical, at that level there is all of his, concerning all of his needs, all of his taste, all of his activities, there is a kind of bland, safe uniformity. Uh, going back to animals, if it makes it easier, uh, lions only have one or two things that they care to eat. Well, meat, but then they, they do not seem to be inclined to order souffles and etc. But there is, at the level of simply bowel survival, the physical survival of an organism, there is, and all creatures, including man at that level, there is a kind of uniformity. But it takes the intellect to have any exception to this. As you should easily see, animals cannot play with their diet. They cannot play, an animal cannot be thirsty and get in a dither over whether he would prefer to go ahead and have water now that he's thirsty or maybe hold out for a while and if he keeps walking past his water hole maybe run across a Perrier machine or a Coke machine. There is a kind of uniformity. They eat the same thing more or less day after day for all of their life, drink the same things, wear the same clothes obviously, live the same life. Man at the physical level has the same attributes. He is not limited to it, but as I assume you know if you've never thought about it, a human being could take two or three food substances, or maybe even one or two, and live off of it. Day after day, a can of pork and beans, or a can of tomato soup, maybe a little white bread. And for 65 or 70 years, everything, if the, assuming that he was not crippled or too weak to start with genetically, you could more or less live like, or you could, maybe not the examples I gave, but you could have just one basic meal and you could live off of it the rest of your life. It takes the intellect to begin to improvise on this. And it then becomes, as I've pointed out to you using ordinary terminology, it becomes a difference between eating and dining, to use the area of food that once you have an intellect, it's, to put it not in an unreasonable manner, now that you've got an intellect, now that the intellect collectively in man has become so widespread as to create civilization, to create other choices, to create free time, that is no longer necessary. It's no longer, it's just no longer necessary or even required that you eat. This uniform, bland, that is safe, food. 
It is simply not. You can if you want to. You can if you find that you could live off white bread and a can of tomato soup once a day. You can do it. But you understand, just being an ordinary civilized person with intellect going, that's almost a, it's almost non-operative. Because even though you could live off that, once the intellect gets going, sometime after the age of 7, 8, 12, 27, 36, one day your intellect by then would know, without any doubt, being silly, that there are other foodstuffs available. And that other people you see advertising and you see billboards of somebody just drooling at the mouth over such and such burger doodle or the new french fries or some new food. And your intellect says, well, why not try that? Do something a little different. It is only then, it takes the intellect, you understand, and this has nothing to do with any form of judgment, any form of criticism. It takes the intellect going before a person will even consider, have any awareness of a different food stuff. And in fact, if you'd like to take a side step right quick, it takes the intellect to even produce, which is the only reason that man can eat something outside of his genetic to the manner born diet. A lion could not. A lion cannot switch over and start eating vegetables. It cannot live. It could not even probably, you follow, this is not necessarily literally true, but a lion could not, if he had enough intellect that he started trying to fool around, let's say that every day he ate meat. That's, that's all he ate. To, to him start worrying about, or to him start fooling around to barbecue it sometimes to uh, grill it, to try it. Of course, he has it tartar every day, but. <laughs> they not only do not have the propensity to do it, they do not even have the ability, is what I want you to understand. It is only man that has, once you have the intellect going, that only has the ability to create any variety in what he eats. Now, that is just a simple fact. There's nothing metaphysical about it. It is not normally taken into direct consideration by people. But it is true with man. And it's not that hard to see, and no biologist probably could deny it if, I, if they listened to that point blank. But who has ever sat and thought of the possibility that you could live off something as limited a diet as I described? I have a couple of pieces of white bread and tomato soup. And I know that high school nutritionalists or somebody with a book to peddle would deny it, and maybe I should add one more thing, maybe a little cabbage once a week. <laughs> but I can assure you that it's down to, and bland, by the way, I know bland is used in a negative sense, but bland, uh, the original number one definition of bland is not a pejorative modifier. Uh, it is seasonable, reasonable, safe. It is that which would be the natural diet of man. So understand the blandness, the uniformity, perhaps is a better word for it, is a uniformity of sleep, of food, but food perhaps the easiest to see. Now let's move into the area, move away from man and beast, and move into the world of the intellect. You have the same situation, obviously, since it grows out of man's body, since the man's neural system grows out of the hormonal system, that you cannot cut off a man's brain and separate it from the lowest, from the crudest, from the grossest, speaking physiologically, for those of you, from the grosser physical aspects of man. You cannot cut off the brain. That's an old science fiction idea that you see thrown around of dreams. And I know there's been cheap science fiction movies or science fiction movies dreaming that the day would come that man would evolve to such a degree that his brain alone could survive. And before science fiction, there has been the crude mystical ideas that continually denounce, including religion, but even into more specific areas of would-be mysticism, and that absolutely denounce man's body. And you have, the world literature is full of saints beating themselves with whips, 
cursing the fact that they get horny, even cursing the fact that they get hungry, and that it's just a burden that perhaps someday the universe or the gods, if we appease them enough and if we try enough to meditate or whatever system, whatever ritual, that they will relieve us of all the burdens, all this crudeness, the grossness of the human body. You go to man's mind. Now the question is, <clears throat> since we're taping this and it's being shown on cable television stations, why would someone sit right now and listen to this as opposed to switching over to some other cable show or anything? Why would somebody watch this as opposed to watching football, professional wrestling, uh, any situation comedy, any hit series, any detective show? Why? Why would someone prefer one, now we're talking about intellectual food now, because that's all it is. Why would they prefer one over the other? And I don't mean to limit this example to just yours truly and us doing this. Why would someone prefer to read Chaucer as opposed to True Romances or People Magazine or vice versa? And where do men get off? What is the basis for men criticizing themselves and their fellow man over the fact that People Magazine, last I checked, outsold again last year all editions of Chaucer. <laughs> Even taking into account it being included parts of it in anthologies. <laughs> why, why does man's intellect, Nietzsche, in, individual person now, we're talking about individual people, why does one man's intellect prefer one form of intellectual food as opposed to another. Why would someone sit right now and watch the opera on PBS as opposed to when they know that uh, a hockey game is on another station or that some comedy show is on another station or some religious show is on another station? And they'll switch back and forth perhaps. But why? What is there? You can definitely live without intellectual food. Now, that is not if you're a normal, ordinary person. And by that I mean it's simply you know that you can live in a brain-dead state. You can actually physically lay there and live for years on life support without an intellect working. So there's no doubt about that. It is not a normal person, obviously. But you do know by now that a person can still take in food digest it and eliminate the food and live for years. Live a full lifespan without an intellect operating, being brain dead. So in that sense, intellectual nourishment is a prerogative. To be ordinary is not, of course. To be sane, to be a real person just at street level, just at the minimal definition of being a human, it's not true, but you are alive. You would fit the definition of a, a viable homo sapien by laying there in a hospital hooked up to life support systems. So on that basis, using that as a comparison, when you get into intellectual food, to begin with, you've got to look at it, trust me, for it's good to start off considering the fact that it is all options, that you could be brain dead and still be alive. So in that sense, everything that you take in intellectually to start with is open to all possibilities. Since none of it is necessary to stay alive, then you cannot, you cannot say, well, one is better than the other. But at the operational level, everyone knows that that's not true. Well, <laughs> let's put it this way. The intelligent insightful people of history, the literature of history, would seem, now does, say otherwise. And all reasonable people, when they hear it or read it, they agree. That is, all the way from religion to philosophers to social critics to authors to any sort of person throughout history who had enough intellectual wherewithal that their words have been remembered, 
somewhere, if they said more than two or three sentences that have been recalled, they will say something about the fact that it is better. And after that, you can start making up your own proverbs or axioms. I don't know. They'll say it's better for a man to see if I can make up almost a classic, put a bunch of them together, but they'll say it's better for a man to live alone in serenity than to live in the midst of success and be miserable. That kind of thing. It's always the dichotomy of presenting, or it's, they'll say it's better for a man to be poor and to live in the grace of God than to be rich and miserable. All of these. And they're all referring to one thing. Do I have to give more examples? I didn't mean to just leave it to religion. But that is, if there would be an archetype of all proverbs and maxims, it all has to do with that kind of dichotomous comparison to say it is better for a man to blah, blah, blah than to blah, blah, blah. Or if they're trying to be more fabulistic, they'll say, uh, it is a dumb fox who will make noise while chasing chickens. <laughs> and it all points out that there are things for a man to do and not do. Now the fox, you've got to remember I said fabulistic because if you took it as being literal, then that would be no more than a physical, having to do with a man's physical life. And Proverbs do not have to do with physical life. Well, let's be truthful. The simple think they do. That's why mysticism turned into religion. And that's why religion never got to the point of mysticism with most people, with the majority. Because the Proverbs, even those that, well, like the Ten Commandments, look at all the rituals of religion, they all apparently have to do with physical reality, with man's physical life, that you should physically be in church on Sunday, be in temple on Saturday. You should not eat meat if you're a so-and-so. You should not eat vegetables if you're a so-and-so. You should not have sex outside of marriage if you're such and such kind of religious person. All of it seems to be having to do with man's behavior. But that is only for the simple because it does not. The reality, if you're, if you're ever going to get anything out of any of the nourishment out there, if, it is, if you're going to see what it is, it does not have to do with what you eat when you go to church or when you go to worship. It does not have to do with that. Not to a man who can see more. That is the childish version. Back to where I was pointing out that all intellectual food, once you see that it, uh, there is nothing specific required. There is no daily governmental dictated or authorized five intellectual food groups from which you should eat each day. There is not. But now each intellectual person, that is each person on this planet who can think, does not think that. They cannot think that at the ordinary level. Because if they thought that, then there would be no friction in the world. And we're not talking about the physical friction. We're not talking about the physical food chain now because that's still there. You're still going to eat other creatures. You're still going to eat other things that are alive, whether they be plants or animals. And they do it to one another. There is, and that's the friction. But intellectually, the friction, comparably speaking, is unnecessary. That it is not necessary intellectually for you to be a Jew, a Christian, a Muslim, an Italian, a rich person, a poor person, a Democrat, a Republican. But at the ordinary level, that's not true. At the ordinary level, they must be that way. And at the ordinary level, and I am not now talking about behavior myself, and I'm not talking about the physical aspect of man, although being a Democrat or Republican, you would think is, well, that's physical. I mean, you go and you sign up to vote in the Democratic primary or into the Republican primary. It's all mental. It is all intellectual. The crude part is to actually go out there and vote, to go out there and register, or to actually say, well, yes, I'm a Democrat. In your mind, you're a Democrat or Republican. And if you're not political, then you're non-political. Every time the idea of politics comes up, the division between, in your mind, is not between Democrats and Republicans. It's between the political people, which I'm sure you would think you'll love, since you're not stupid, ignorant. They don't understand the conspiracy. They're just wasting their time. Your division is not between Democrats and Republicans. Your division, then, is between those who are political and those who are not. This friction is necessary. There cannot be uniformity in thought. 
if that sounds too strange, let's back up one more, again, one more time. You understand there cannot, at the physical level, there cannot be uniformity of food at the physical level. In other words, elephants, tigers, lions, cheetahs, monkeys, hogs, chickens, ducks, humans, we cannot all eat the same thing. And you understand why. Pretty soon the kitchen, planet Earth, would be out of whatever it was. And so you have this diversity to the point that everything on this planet gets eaten by somebody, by something, and in turn is eaten. So there is no waste and there is no uniformity. There is no one menu for the creatures, for life on this planet. Individually, there is a uniformity and a limited menu in that a lion must eat basically one thing. Now back to the intellect. In the intellect, consider, is there a uniformity? Or is there a parallel that everyone cannot think the same thing? What if you looked at thoughts, ideas? What if you looked at them as being as physical as red meat or vegetables? In the same way that not all creatures on this planet, all the big cats cannot eat the same food. All the sentient creatures cannot eat the same food. Some of us got to eat, especially when you take into account one locale. You have elephants eating certain kinds of tree bark, then you have certain other kinds of hogs will come along and they might eat parts of tree bark that they discard. It all fits, but they cannot have the same menu. They cannot have the same inherent taste. How about intellectually? What if everyone thought the same thing? Now, ordinary people's common sense, as they call it, would uh, deny and say that that's gone too far, that thoughts are not like that. <clears throat> people cannot think the same thing. People cannot eat the same intellectual food. That is why there's apparently taste. That is why someone will pick up one book as opposed to another. Now, if you ask them why, or if you ask them why they're watching one TV show as opposed to another, why they have certain philosophical, religious, political beliefs as opposed to some other, and you ask them in a fairly reasonable manner, and apparently are interested, they will give you reasons. But people will also give you reasons if you not all that judgmental. If you're staying at a restaurant and somebody orders or a fast food place and somebody orders a fish sandwich, you go, I never have had a fish sandwich. I can't, I can't imagine, you know, fish is one thing and hamburgers and hot dogs are another, but fish on bread, how can you eat a fish sandwich? If you do it without going, yeah, the person will speak to you. Or if it's just some meal, something new on the menu and you go, uh, and you hear them order it and you say, well, I've never tried one of those. It always sounded sort of, I don't know, not very appetizing. Is it really good? They will tell you. And if, if you know how to do it, you can also make it a little accusatory and people will defend it. I was trying to get around to the word rationalize it to give you a reason. They go, well, you just don't understand. You can say, well, I am a vegetarian. Let's put it that way. And they'll say, well, see, that you just don't understand. They have a, now this new Cajun, this Hungarian Cajun deep fried chicken sandwich. <laughs> And you go, I can't, I can't imagine, how could you have a Hungarian sliced Cajun deep fried chicken sandwich? And they said, well, just try it. And you go, well, no, I'm a vegetarian, so I couldn't have one, but I just look at it and I think, that can't be. What would it taste like? You know, how can you eat something like that? And they will give you, quote, some sort of rationalization. And I don't mean in the sense that it needs to be rationalized, but the person will defend their taste. If you ask someone, why are you reading? Marcus Aurelius, instead of... Uh, Esquire magazine or Playboy, they will tell you. Or conversely, if you say, how can you sit around and read all this trashy literature when there's such good literature and we've got thousands of years and it's all available? You do it just the right way without pushing it too far and they will rationalize it. In the full sense of the word, that is, they will, they will give you an explanation. And there is none. It's why it is so easy for everyone to be a critic. You don't have to have a job on a paper. Everyone is a critic. That's part of eating a different intellectual fare than your neighbor. Because were you not critical? Did you not feel that there was some room for, whether you do it overtly or not, some form of room for criticism to 
criticism for his intellectual fare. If it weren't for that, you'd be eating it. <coughs> that is, if you were a Democrat and someone says, uh, I understand that your brother, uh, to whom you're very close, I understand he is just a fanatical Republican. You go, yeah. And you think, well, you guys are just close. I mean, you live next door to each other. and blah, blah, blah. You say, well, I can't believe that you grew up in the same environment, went to the same school, and you seem to have the same sort of, or you are in the same socioeconomic bracket now that you're grown. But how could you have such diverse political leanings? And he can tell you, because he has to be able to describe, and now forget that there's any validity, he has to be able to describe some distinction. And that's simple to see once you see how simple it is, because if, if he did not draw a distinction, then he'd be one. If he cannot draw a distinction, if you said, well, I've been thinking on this matter, I've been studying it for years, and I'm not even that interested in politics, but... I know that everyone else is, most people, and so I've been studying the matter, and I have gone back, I have spent thousands of hours reading the platforms of uh, parties over the last 40 years, 50 years here in this country, and I'm going to tell you what, and I've seen the programs. I have gone back and followed the legislative uh, victories when each new administration would come out, and I've decided one thing. There is not a penny's worth of difference between Democrats and Republicans, and I can prove it to you here statistically. And the other person goes, no, 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 that's not true. It's always from a something past a two-eyed view. Yeah, it's not true, and yeah, it is true. Mm -hmm. There is no difference, except there has to be a perceived difference. Because you've got to remember that whatever the, the, the total menu of man intellectually is irrelevant. That to begin with, there is no difference. And so, if people did not consider there was a difference, I'll have to mix up the metaphors again. <laughs> if lines suddenly believed, well, wait a minute, there's not that big a deal between vegetables and red meat, lions would die. <laughs> now, if you can take that allegorically back to where we we're talking about to the effect, <laughs> there has to be apparent differences, but in this case, the differences are simply that, apparent. At least you have any doubt. I assume that everyone was reasonably content with my description that all creatures must physically stick to a diet. There is something back to physical food. There is a general, fairly specific, limited area of foodstuffs that each creature must eat or it will die. There's no big secret. But look at intellectually. Now, ordinary people, they would almost think, well, that's true with me. Because you can take an ordinary person and say, wait a minute. Uh, by the way, we're offering, uh, what would interest you? Would $5,000, would $50,000 get your attention? The person go, yeah. And you go, uh, are you religious? And they go, yes. And you go, what? And you say, well, I'm an Orthodox Jew. Would you take it seriously? Yes, it's, I mean, it's the heart of my life. And you go, all right, $50,000. You consider that decent? Yes. All right, will you, uh, will you become a Muslim for $50,000? And they go, no. Or vice versa. They take it quite seriously. Now, let's say that you're standing outside that situation. Let's say that you're an agnostic. Well, let's say that you're a Christian. See if that helps. And you hear this conversation. And I step away from it, if I was the one doing it, and I look at the Christian behind the curtain who heard my offer to this Jew or this Muslim to change. And I look at him like, what do you think? He go, well, you know, that's kind of nuts. <laughs> or, you know, he looked like, give me that offer. Or, you know. You understand, he would find it if you had no interest. Now, we're speaking on one and a half and sometimes two and a half allegorical legs now. But those that, a person disinterested, let me jump back to another allegory, asking an eagle, and say, do you realize that lions will not eat? I mean, no matter how you fix it, a lion will not eat rutabakas or cauliflower. Maybe I picked the wrong thing up. You had told a rabbit that. And a rabbit go, are you serious? And you go, yeah, I even offered a lion $50,000 if he would go on a diet of nothing but vegetables. And the rabbit go, and he turned it down? And he finds it amazing. <coughs> but you understand that there is life or death validity there too. But now intellectually. 
if you've been following this, uh, not just because I say it, but by now you should see what the area to which I am pointing, intellectually, there is no parallel. Or else, how do you explain this? Now, an ordinary person can't even go this far when it's just as blunt as that big old statue that's in the center of everyone's hometown, no matter where you are, Toronto, Los Angeles, Minneapolis, Philadelphia, Berlin. In a town square is a large statue of Captain Blunt. <laughs> Except no one can see it. It's in every one of your hometowns, but you have never seen it. Which, you can figure that one on your own or work on it. The, here's the bluntness. Ordinary people believe, remember where we were, they believed that there would be a very similar, and some people would even claim it was worse, there was a higher degree of import to what one thinks. That is, that they see that a lion must eat meat or will die, and the person will go, yes. And if I said, yes, but now if we get above the level of just physical survival and we get into the world of the intellect, there is nothing similar. And they wait, and I say, for instance, it doesn't matter whether you are a Christian or a Muslim. And they go, no, 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 you went too far. And if I say, it doesn't matter whether you are a royalist or a Republican. Oh, no, 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 no. It doesn't matter whether you are a Democrat or a Republican. No, 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 no. Now, ordinary people, we're not making fun of it. This is the heart of civilization. They would say, nah, it is important. It is important. Here's the bluntness. And they, and they would say it's not only important, as many of you, well, I know that you understand this, there's some people that would say it's even more important. It's more important what, that one is faithful to one's religious belief, or one is faithful to one's nation, to one's tribe. It is more important to be faithful to that. If you want, I'm talking now for an ordinary person. They could say it's more important to be faithful to that intellectual nourishment than it is your physical diet. Hmm. Which is why some people, uh, I know this is not actually middle of the road, but that is why there is such thing as martyrdom. And even those who at the last minute would go, well, all right, wait a minute, don't shoot, I will convert. <laughs> there are many people who talk as though they would be, that they would, be prepared for martyrdom. That is, I would die, which is eat bad food, bullets, instead of bread and tomato soup. I will eat bullets before I would change my mind. That is, before I would change my religion, before I would deny my God or before I would deny my family. They will say that. That's very common. And it passes for being enlightened. It passes for being extremely civilized. But now look at the bluntness. Did you all follow the basis that I was attempting to establish over the last several minutes? That sane, civilized, sophisticated people would insist that there is an equal importance to what one intellectually feeds on. That is what one thinks, what one believes. That it is as, as equally as important as what one physically eats. And there would be people in various ways, they've already done it, philosophers and, would, and religious thinkers, have stated so, that it is more important. That it would be better for you to kill yourself than to deny God. It would be better that you should die like a dog than to turn on the religion of your fathers or to turn up on your heritage, that you would be better off. And there are many people. They don't, I'm not talking about those that are certifiably insane. The people go, yes, that's true, because it seems to be the definitive Well, I started to give you a way out, but probably the definitive, if not at the height of several ways to define what is civilized. Because you could say, well, ordinary people, the uncivilized, a man with not much of a soul, a man with not, a man that's hardly a man is the kind of guy that you could simply say, well, what are you, sir? And the guy goes, well, I'm an Italian Roman Catholic. And you say, uh, by the way, uh, I'll give you $50 if you'll become a Jew. And he goes, oh, sure. Or conversely, if he says, well, certainly not. And you go, all right. Forget the $50, I'm going to shoot you if you don't. He'll say, you know, where would I sign up? And you could say, ordinary people, and I say, well, that is a, right there, there is the cutting edge, there is the defining line between actually being a real, civilized, anybody worthy of the name man. That you, if you don't stand for something, then you're not a man. 
If there's not something that you would almost die for, you're not a man. And what are they talking about? They're not talking about physical, something you'll die for. It's only children who go back to that and say, well, uh, that would be somebody that would go into a church and spit on an altar. That's not, what, that's not the reality behind it. Because you, you can get by with all sorts of things. That is still an intellectual act. They just have to take it to a behavioral level, something that they can see and talk about. Intellectually, people believe that there is a limited, important, specific diet. The proof being that they do, that they are one, that they are eating something. That a man says, yes, I am a Jew, or yes, I am a Muslim, or yes, I am a Democrat, and I'm proud of it. Yes, I'm, I, I've done a lot of thought, and this, this is the way to live. And if you said, but the intellectual diet is non Uniform. There is no specific intellectual diet in the same way that you have a physical diet that is fairly limited. And they go, you're wrong. Here is where the statue of Mr. Blunt comes in. <coughs> the bluntness being this. That's very blunt. Then you're saying that the right way to think and I just picked out the obvious ones of political and etc. ideas. And so it's not just limited to that. But you say, all right, the way you think in general, you're saying that that is the proper diet for man. And any intelligent person on this planet, they'll maybe hedge around a little bit. But they will finally say yes, because if everyone thought more or less like I do. Now, I didn't think it up. I got it from my father, so I'm not trying to brag. But if we all thought more or less the way I do, because I'm a free market, Republican, Democratic idea, laissez-faire and religious ideas, etc. So if everyone thought like this, the world would be better off. You understand? But they say, I do have certain ideas. And if everyone thought this way, we'd be better off. They are saying that to varying degrees, that to think, to eat intellectual food that they're not thriving on, they're saying at least to some degree is poisonous. It is not as healthy as what they're doing. The other people should not be thinking the way they think. They should not be eating this other intellectual food. People should not be, says a man who reads the classics, people should not be reading trashy literature. People should not be, says a man who listens to classical music, people should not be listening to rap music, to rock and roll, to country and western. Where is Mr. Blunt? They will insist, as they're supposed to, reasonable, intelligent, sophisticated people, that there is no, that there is a specific diet that is proper for man intellectually. I'll finally bring you Mr. Blunt. If that be true, sir, speaking to Mr. Sophisticated historical paradigm for humanity. I say, if that be true, how explaineth thee the fact that the world has been full of people, is still full of people, who are eating intellectually, according to you? Venomous, potentially poisonous, but poisonous food. How do we continue collectively to thrive? There is no answer. The mind, the ordinary mind cannot even, the sentence is simple as hell. The idea is fairly simple. Drag you into a newer, swampier, more complex area. All of this is based upon the belief in great ideas. As always, it does not mean that everyone on this planet's ever used that term, would ever think to use it, but that's what it's based on. That is, that some intellectual food is better than others. But then everyone, be they religious, philosophical, whether they have a fifth grade education or whether they have a doctorate degree, whether they are farmers or whether they are atomic physicists, they believe that there are great ideas, great-er ideas, 
It could come if they were, the closer they are to the soil, the closer they are back to the physical level of humanity, the more their ideas of wisdom are tied to behavior, a physical life, but it's all the same. They believe that there are ideas that are better. They believe that they're generally, the closer they are to the soil, the closer they are to these, the simpler they are, the more they think the, the great ideas are probably within a religion. Their religion, their father's religion, religion in general. That that is where the great ideas are, the greater ideas. Because any civilized person on this planet would tell you, they will insist, even after hearing me for the last 45 minutes sort of disassemble some of that, they would still say, well, that's all right. But there's still ideas that are better, greater. When I'm saying better, I'm not talking now about logic, you understand. I'm not talking about science and whether uh, actual quantum physics in total replaced mechanical physics. We're not talking about that. We're talking about great ideas, that is, ideas that help explain, that help nourish man's intellect. Most people, don't, ordinary people, won't call it man's soul. We're talking about the ideas in art, in culture, almost everything but the hard sciences. Because two and two, once man made up that game, two and two is four. That's the great idea. Two and two is not three. Two and two is not five. That is not a great idea. It will not work. The great ideas... Well, that is, there's nothing to compare it. You understand, I just want you to get that out of the way. You, you do not compare any intellectual person. You do not say, uh, two and two equals four, according to some people. And they go, yeah, and they go, well, there's this uh, con alternative theory that says two and two equals three. Which is best? Well, that's not even open to question. It's not a matter of best. You say, which is the grander idea? Which is the better idea? It's not better, just one of them is correct. The idea of uh, the notion the term great ideas has to do with human behavior, which I'm pointing out to you the behavior aspect is the simplest, the simplest manifestation of it. It is the human intellect. So there, why do people, everyone, why do, would everyone give their agreement? They have to. That some ideas are better, are greater than others. But everybody assumes they will immediately say, yes, some are better than others. Not Remember, not correct, not right. But if you say, do you think it's a better idea? Is it a better idea to try and get along with your neighbors, no matter who they are, your fellow man, than it is to just keep a knife open in your pocket just every time you see somebody you don't like or that somebody says something you don't like, and you try to kill them? Which is the better idea? And they all say, well, the first one is a better idea. Just a little past that, as you say, not just behavior, but are there better ideas? In fact, are there great ideas in life? So I just keep chopping this apart into little bitty weenie pieces. Let's try to get back to the grand salami. If you ask even people, they do not have to be religious in a practical sense. But if you say, do you believe that there have been on this planet or are on this planet ideas that compared to everything else qualify as being like great ideas or out of extraordinary ideas. And they would go, yes, or they might go, well, what do you mean? If you say, well, uh, like in most religions, it says that the greatest thing that a man can do, the, the highest that a man can aspire to in this life is to love his fellow man, to be able to be of help to his fellow man when he can. All right, any civilized person on this planet, regardless of their race, religion, and et cetera, will go, yes. And if you said, do you consider on a scale of ideas it, that that is a greater idea, that that is a greater notion than it is to say, uh, it's better to only have fun, it's, it's better to only drink maybe once a week. It's better to only have fun amongst, uh, during your time off from work. I'm just trying to think of something absolutely simple. It is better not to drink and drive. It is better if you're going to try and hold a relationship together, a marriage together, not to have sex outside the marriage. They're going, yeah, yeah. And all those may appear to be important. And if you said, but relatively speaking, do you, do you believe that there are great ideas? People will say yes. Life makes them say yes. 
you have to say yes to that. Whether you like my examples and whether no sense me dragging out more, you have to believe that or you are not civilized. You would not even be listening to this. So to whatever degree and whatever example you might have to come up with yourself, every civilized intellectual, every civilized person on this planet must agree that there are ideas that are incomparably in the true sense that you just can't compare. You can't compare that it's good, that it's a good idea not to drink and drive. And everybody goes, yes. Okay. Even people who drink and drive will go, yes. Assuming they're sober when you sell them that, and they go, yes. And you say, well, is that the same level? Is a great an idea as that is, and save lives, and I said, oh, yeah, yeah. Is that on the same level as love your fellow man as yourself? And they'll go, no. It's a great idea, but the other one, because the point being, if they got to it, or if you pushed it far enough, they would have to agree that there seems to be originally uh, uh, sui generis ideas. They had to be like the father, the mother of all ideas, which ordinary people get back to the idea of God. But there had to be, once the intellect started, it was like at first with great ideas. There had to be at least one great idea to get the intellect going. And after that, everything else is sort of, you know, could be a little closer to a great idea or a little further off or way far off. Like that it's real important to always have dress in the latest fashion, that that's a good idea. And you can be intelligent enough to understand right quick and you hear it and you think of all the circumstances where it is a good idea, whether it be good for your social life, be good at work, that you know, all that. But comfortably speaking, that is just a medre idea. It's just a nothing idea compared to the idea of a little more civilized, just an ordinary speaking, a little more civilized man, a little more insightful man that aspires to something else that he just can't deny. If you say, well, is that what you own your tombstone? That always gets me. If you say, you want to live your life on your tombstone, it says, he was always hip. He was, he was always fashionably dressed. Is that what you own or would you like something like, he had ideas that inspired many. You know, that here lies so-and-so, a true thinker. Something like and people go, well, yeah, the last. I mean, why does it matter once you're dead whether you were in fashion? Where do the great ideas, ordinary people believe the great ideas come from God if it's pushed or they believe it would perhaps if they're not religious by now they would say well it's in some way is a kind of genetic, it's part of the original Big Bang which now comes out in us neurally speaking. In other words they would say there is some sort of far distant, there is some sort of origin of great ideas or the great idea and everything else came from that and everything else is a lesser reflection. How about a more specific description rather than gods and big bangs is what appears to be a great idea or what seems what everyone accepts to be a great idea and what would strike you probably as a great idea. Think of any example you want. The, the great ideas come more directly, spring more directly from man hormonally. More directly. This is not to deny, this is not to ignore the fact now that no matter what you think came originally from hormones. The greatest idea that Einstein's brain or Planck's brain ever had or Socrates' brain ever had started with a sweet potato. Of course, I can keep going back, but it started with a sweet potato, a piece of meat. Then we can start tracing it and then it got in his stomach. In case you want to get from the externals and say the greatest thought that Plato ever had originated in his stomach. And it did. If anyone doubts that, go back and find your statue of Mr. Blunt there in the time in the middle of the square. The greatest thought ever had started in a man's stomach. What passes or what's accepted as being the great thoughts, the spiritual, the philosophical, the intellectual, great thoughts of humanity start I'm giving you the distinction. They start more directly. They spring more directly from hormones. They all come from hormones, but it's as though there is a two possible ways that they either, it's like, I'm just making up on a drawing, but here it is, Aristotle's stomach, Buddha's stomach, Moses' stomach, and it goes, no, no, no.
I'm telling you that the great ideas, and it does not just have to be now a Moses or a Muhammad or a Confucius, because if you have any success at this, you're finally going to have your own great ideas. And it's no offense to those who've gone before, but to each person, once you have the experience and the taste of it, is always a brand new great idea. <laughs> and it's yours. That is the experience. That is the awakening, the enlightenment, is you have your own great idea. And I'm not going to say anymore. It's just you have it. It doesn't deny anybody else's. No offense. You're then in extremely pleasant, enjoyable company, and you'll understand it. But I'm telling you, the great ideas, as opposed to that, and this is not an unreasonable drawing and symbolism of it, but the greater the ideas, think about it, because this, I know it sounds strange at first, listen, but the great idea, whatever it is, that the greatest idea is to love God, to love life, to love your fellow man. As far removed as that sounds, and I'm just using anyone that any group of people takes as a great idea, what it, compared to that, what it is, it more directly springs from that. I can elucidate and simplify in a sense that and say what it springs from is a more, it springs more directly from the needs of humanity. The greater the idea, the more it springs directly, more directly now, more directly, it's all relative, from hormones. When it goes through that kind of somewhat rococo complicated version, that's when it comes out as being, and it becomes binary, for one thing, because then it comes out as conflicting possible nourishment, that you can either accept it or reject it. Whereas, just to stick with the, perhaps the best known, that the purpose of life is to love life, or to love God, as people used to say. No human on this planet we might have to change the few of the words, you know, God, and et cetera, can deny that because it is in the genetics of man. But then if you say, that would be a great idea. If you say, what's the purpose of life in some group, some, or some idea you heard, and it says, to love God or to love your fellow man as yourself, which is the same thing. You cannot deny that. But if you say, what is the purpose of life? And the answer came back, to be a Catholic. And you went, nah. And so they told you why you should be a Catholic. And they finally get around to saying, well, and you say, well, what is it about being a Catholic? That doesn't strike me as right. That doesn't seem like the purpose of life because somebody else down the street told me it's to be a Jew or to be a Protestant. And they go, no, no. And they, they give you the sales pitch as to why they eat white bread and tomato soup. They give you their rationalization. They give you the explanation as to why they are a Muslim. You go, okay. And somewhere in there, Maybe soon, maybe a little later, they will eventually come up on the great idea. They will say, well, part of the purpose is, and they'll start you know, to glorify Allah, to uh, revere the name of Muhammad, to uh, help your fellow man, uh, and they'll finally get around to whatever the great idea. In this case, let's say that love God, that that is the great idea, that you have got to love God, and it's not something you, you know, people here go, yeah, not sure, but yeah, yeah. That would be the great idea. But once it gets a little more complicated, as it's supposed to, and it gets into what's the purpose in life, or what's a great idea? And somebody says, a great idea is to be a Buddhist. And of course, it's a Buddhist that tells you that. And you go, well, I don't know, that doesn't sound like a great idea. I don't say there's anything wrong with it, but that doesn't sound like, and they start describing. Here is the great idea, and it gets over here, and it will get included in that, but then it's no longer a great idea because it's debatable. Because you can tell, wait a minute. You say you're a Buddhist, but do you realize there are more Hindus in the world than Buddhists? I mean, how are you going to explain that? And then they try. But there is no explanation. It's simply friction. It is the binary forces that are necessary to run an intellect in a 3D environment. The general purpose intent of tonight was to point out not only the people when I start off with a rhetorical question asking well, why does someone 
why would someone listen to this as opposed to listening to the top 40 radio station, or as opposed to listening to uh, a political speech? Why does anybody choose anything intellectually? Forget their explanations, because each explanation is just part of why they do it. I'm giving you the physical, the electrochemical physical reason, because there is no bland, uniform, intellectual diet. Each person is driven. Each person apparently picks out what they like. But it does not nourish, not in any full sense, because if it did, then contrary, if you picked the wrong one, it would malnourish. Mm -hmm. It would poison you. That if it were true, that it's necessary, that it's helpful. It is down there, down there required that people be a Jew, a Christian. Because whoever, they, they all say that. That is at the heart of all religion. That's the heart of proselytizing, trying to recruit others under the name of helping them. Well, you poor people, how long have you been a Muslim? Well, come right over here and let, let me show you. You should have been Jewish to start with. <laughs> that they believe that not, not eating what I am eating, speaking about to each person, those who are not eating what I'm eating, they are running grave risk. They could lose their soul, but they are running grave risk because they are not getting the nourishment they need which is a form of poison, if you don't like to look at it as strongly as poison, they're malnutritioned by not doing this, except for this fact. O ye of little ability to see the statue of Captain Blunt. <laughs> if that be true, again, I must ask you, in all goodwill, how do you explain the fact that there have been people who are not Jews, people who are not Muslims, people who are not anything that you ever heard of, far outnumbering whatever you are at any particular time throughout history. How has it survived? Because life survives. Because there is no one diet. And yet, but beyond all of that, what I want you to see is there still strikes everybody, be they Christian, Muslim, Jew, Italian, whether they're alive now, whether we can drive them back up from 5,000 years ago, which we can, they're inside of you. You can drag them back up. And they all believe that there are great ideas and very likely one great idea, but there are ideas that by God qualify as great compared to everything else. And after that, they're left. If you say, well, what do you think? Then they always have to lapse back to religion, to some form. They don't have to lapse. There it is. It is closer to the hormonal level. Think about it. That is where the great religious and philosophical ideas, they're closer to man's stomach than the ideas about, well... Maybe you shouldn't screw other women besides your wife. Maybe we shouldn't actually drink as much. Now all those ideas, you go, well, they had some validity, but, you know, that's not a great idea. A great idea is love God or find God. Unite with God, whatever it is. And that sounds to be far removed. The first idea is about don't drink and drive. That sounds physical. That sounds, oh, well, anybody should know that. But the idea is about Love God. And that's a great idea. We're getting now into the true area of the spirit. And I'm telling you, compared to that, it is almost the opposite. Because the great ideas spring more directly right from man's hormones than the securitous route that comes out philosophically, that comes out religious instead of metaphysical. That comes out religious in the sense that there is no such thing as religious. There's such things as being religious here, being religious there, being Christian, being a Jew, having an opinion, being a Democrat, being a Republican. A great idea has no opposite. A man's stomach has no opposite. A man's hunger has no opposite. A lion's appetite has no opposite. Only man's mind at the ordinary level apparently has an opposite. That the menu seems to be brought out, and it's actually blank. But anyway, and men look and they go, well, let's see, I think I'll, I think I'll have a, I think I'll have an existentialist neo-Christian. And somebody that's at the same table on the same planet goes, ah, I believe I'll have an agnostic. And I think, I think I'll be sort of a libertarian agnostic. And they think that that's important. They think that that is of some significance. And there is only one diet. There is only one great idea. <clears throat> and I'm not going to tell you the great idea, but it is directly, it is more directly from the stomach to here. Everything else goes on and on and on. And this has no opposite. It has no foe any more than your stomach has a foe. <laughs>